الحمد لله الحمد لله نحمده ونصلي ونسلم على رسوله الكريم أما بعد فقد قال الله تبارك وتعالى في القرآن المجيد والفرقان الحميد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم ولا تكونوا كالذين نسوا الله فأنساهم أنفسهم أولئك هم الفاسقون صدق الله العظيم وقال الله تبارك وتعالى في شأن حبيبه مخبرا وآمرا إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على سيدنا ومولانا محمد وعلى آل سيدنا ومولانا محمد وبارك وسلم وصلي عليه My dear respected brothers and sisters in Islam Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Welcome to a handful of lectures on the issues of LGBT in particular the Islamic viewpoint on this matter and let me say at the outset this is a presentation and an expression of freedom of speech of freedom of religion of freedom of thought and freedom of conscience this is completely allowed within the laws of the United Kingdom within the Human Rights Act of, of the uh, European Parliament and also the acts relating to freedom of political and religious thought in the United Nations so this is not a presentation on promoting hatred or violence or discrimination it is an expression of clarity as to what Islam says on this matter what is right and what is wrong and the verse I recited at the beginning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says وَلَا تَقُونُوا كَالَّذِينَ نَسُوا اللَّهَ فَأَنْسَاهُمْ أَنفُسَهُمْ أُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْفَاسِقُونَ This is Surah Hashar, verse 19 Don't be like those who forgot Allah He made them forget themselves أُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْفَاسِقُونَ They become sinful, they are sinful And this is what I suppose, in a sense, this is all about We are forgetting about Allah's laws, Allah's commandments, Allah's requirements and for those people who believe in God there is this divine morality we have to follow, we have to accept if we reject Allah then the net result is we make up our own morality one day this is right, the next day the same thing becomes wrong and we can see that in the passing of the laws of various states and countries which don't follow any religion they will pass laws as to this is forbidden one day even punishable punishable by death and a few years later it's completely is completely allowed and there are various examples which I haven't got time to go into in terms of then your own morality it, it will change it will deviate it will be however people feel but ultimately it will come down to one's desires one's desires become their guide and we will address that in more detail later on but there's a very um, apt verse on this which we find in 4523 Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says وَأَضَلَّهُ اللَّهُ عَلَىٰ عِلْمٍ وَخَتَمَ عَلَىٰ سَمِعِهِ وَقَلْبِهِ وَجَعَلَ عَلَىٰ بَصَرِهِ غِشَاوَةً فَمَنْ يَهْدِيهِ مِنْ بَعْدِ اللَّهُ أَفَلَا تَذَكَّرُونَ Haven't you seen the one who has chosen his desires as his ilah, as his lord? So Allah is mentioning this. He says this will happen. There are people who will follow their own desires. Their morality will be purely desire-based. And Allah says these people have gone astray and Allah allows them to go astray because they reject Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and as a net result of this their ears become sealed وَخَطْمَ ala سَمْعِهِ وَقَلْبِهِ their hearts become sealed and in terms of their vision وَعَلَى بَصْرِهِ غِشَاوَةِ 
the, their vision becomes veiled. A veil comes over their vision. In other words, they, they've stopped being able to distinguish between right and wrong because of their initial rejection of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and their acceptance of their own desires. If you go down this path, you go down the path which makes matters worse for yourselves. And Allah is very clear. Uh, Allah says, don't you understand what's happening here? Don't you realize? You should realize the, the wrongs which you are doing and the principle upon, upon which you've based your morality. It is completely wrong. So these two verses set a very important scene and a very important mindset for what we are talking about. And let's start with some definitions. We'll talk about we're talking about LGBT and some people add the Q. Well, L is lesbian, G is gay, B is bisexual, and uh, T is transgender. Some people put Q, which uh, it could be a number of things. It could be a, a questioning or queer, whatever people want to put. And we're going to address the homosexuality and, and lesbian, etc. But the, the homosexuals and lesbian are those people who believe uh, same-sex relationships are permissible and that goes obviously against uh, against Islam against Islamic teaching and Islamic understanding transgender people uh, uh, bisexual people they believe that uh, relationships amongst all genders is is permissible and again that goes against uh, Islamic teachings now within this we include the heterosexual people who have no limits as to uh, as to their behavior so sex outside marriage is completely permissible as far as far as they are concerned so we're addressing all of these all of these issues in terms of uh, transgender i wish i could give you a definition i there's no experts on this uh, transgender is is basically make it up as you go along that, that's what it is. And I can justify all of, all of that. We'll look at that in detail in, in another presentation. But, it, but in this one, I'm, I'm, I, I, I'm sorry, I can't define it. Okay? There are 71 genders on Facebook to choose from. And if you look at those genders, so-called, you'll see how confused everybody is becoming and everybody has become. So let's focus. Uh, so we are going to focus, inshallah, on the LG be aspects uh, and the Islamic um, understanding of this and it's pertinent and useful to include or put forward the scientific understanding on gender uh, and on uh, 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 being male or female. We have, as you know, as human beings, we have 23 pairs of chromosomes. Chromosomes are essentially your genetic makeup and the 23rd pair decide whether you are a male or a female. If you have a Y chromosome in the last pair, it means you are a male. And you, if you have a double X, an XX chromosome, chromosomes, then you are female. Now, let's understand this. This uh, identification doesn't happen at puberty. It doesn't happen when you're born. It happens at conception. At conception, you are, it is decided whether you are XX or XY. And this information is contained in every single cell of the human body. So it starts at conception, it stays with you in the womb. You are born in this way as well. It stays with you throughout puberty, throughout adulthood, and, and stays with you until death. It's an identification. It's a marker which doesn't go away and it's in every single cell. So if you look at it from this very clinical point of view, we are as we are conceived. We are either male or female at conception. And nothing can change that. There's no such thing as a gay gene or a, a transgender gene or a lesbian gene or, or bisexual gene. Islam argues that these are lifestyle choices. <clears throat> yes, you can you can say, but uh, I have a desire for this, a desire for that. Yes, we have desires for many things. We have to control our desires. Islam forbids just a few things. Islam forbids those things which are not good for us. 
And yes, people will have the desires to do those things. For example, drinking alcohol, for example, eating haram food, for example, hating somebody. These are against uh, Islamic teachings. So we have a desire to do these things. And Islam says, Allah says, control your desires. So if you choose to do something which Allah forbids, Islam will argue, we will argue, it's a lifestyle choice. And you are born with XX and you are born with XY. But again, we haven't got time to cover this in, in as much detail as I would like. Let's go back to the topic which we are focusing on today. And the first question to ask is what should be our approach as Muslims? Because we are now faced with people telling us that this lifestyle is is correct, it's permissible, it's it's part of our being, we have to accept it. No. We don't have to accept it. Again, this is a presentation to express freedom of speech and religion and thought and conscience and all that. This is not an exercise in hatred or phobia or phobias. This is, this is not an exercise in discrimination. If anybody is discriminated against in this world, it's Muslims. So, so we, are, we are promoting what Islam says very calmly, very maturely, to express civil disagreement. And that's what it's all about. To disagree is to be human. To disagree respectfully is to be a good human, is to be a good Muslim. And that's essentially what we're doing today. So, in terms of our Islamic duties, Allah says in the Holy Quran, وَلْتَكُمْ مِنْكُمْ أُمَّةٌ يَدْعُونَ إِلَى الْخَيْرِ وَيَأْمُرُونَ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ وَيَنْهَوْنَ عَنَ الْمُنْكَرِ وَأُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْمُفْلِحُونَ They should be from you your Ummah, a group, who invite to the good and enjoin what is right and forbid what is wrong. And these are the ones who are successful. So it becomes our duty not to keep quiet, not to allow things to be said which are against Islam. We have to speak up, we are allowed to speak up. It's it's enshrined in Islamic law, it's enshrined in UK law, it's enshrined in human rights legislations all over the world, including the European Conventions and including the United Nations Conventions. Again, we can talk about this in detail in, in another presentation, but these are our rights. And in terms of schooling, schooling is a, a, a cooperation between... Education has to be a cooperation between the schools and the parents. Therefore, parents' consultation is absolutely vital. And within that consultation, Muslims will say, yes, you can teach this if you're required to by law, but you don't have to teach it that this is right. You have to say some people agree with it and some people don't agree with it. And not to agree with it, that's also enshrined in legislations. And schools aren't mandated to teach that this is right. This is not a Third Reich country whereby we are forced to accept what we fundamentally disagree with. I'm sorry. We, we, yes, we have to accept it exists. We have to be uh, uh, tolerant and, uh, and maybe even appreciative in some in, in instances. Um, but we don't have to accept that it's the right thing to do if we fundamentally object to it. And Islam does fundamentally object to it. And Islam does fundamentally object to the way it's being taught in, in some schools, not in all schools, but in some schools. And the Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, was also clear, of course he was clear. And you find this uh, saying in Nisa'i, in Abu Dawud, in Muslim, the Prophet said, he said very clearly, if you see something which is wrong, which is evil, try and change it with the hand. And that means if you see something happening, say for example, someone being abused or mugged or assaulted or whatever, if you have the capacity and ability, you should try and try and assist, try and help. Even phoning the police, even shouting, even whatever you can do, getting other people involved to stop the evil that's happening in front of you. You've seen videos where shops are being robbed and the public get together and grab the assailants. Yes, this is what we're talking about. There's nothing new or, 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 or weird in this. The Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, change it with the hand, if you can. If you can't, فَبِلِسَانِهِ 
then address it with your tongue, say something, write about it, do something about it. In a sense, I am fulfilling a little bit of my duty by uh, producing this uh, or, or talking about this in this presentation. So change it with the with the tongue, say something about it with the tongue. And if you can't do that, then at least you should think in your heart, in your mind, in your soul, it's wrong. That's the weakest of faith. We don't want to be those with the weakest of faith. We have ability to speak, we have ability to express, we have haq on, on the side of Islam. So we are here to advise and educate not just ourselves but those around us as to what Islam says in a very respectful and a very friendly way and that's what this is about. And you also find in other teachings of Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam a, a verse uh, is recited by Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala an, where he says, Ya yuwaladheena amanu alaykum anfusakum la yadurrukum man dhalla idha hdadaytum O oh, believers, save your souls, for if you have the right guidance, no one who strays can harm you. And then he continued, he said, I heard the Prophet say, وسلم, that when the people see the wrongdoer and they don't stop him, they don't stop him from doing wrong, then soon Allah will envelop you all in a punishment from him. So it's a dire warning from Rasulullah sallallahu if we don't say anything, if we don't do anything, then the consequences will be amongst all of us. And what, what are the consequences? We don't know what Allah has planned. But Allah is watching. We have to answer for what we say and what we don't say. It's very important. We have to answer for what we say and what we don't say. So, alhamdulillah, Muslims are objecting in a very nice way. And we have a right to object in the way this is being taught and the way this is being handled, almost as if some extremists have taken over the agenda. I mean, this, this whole teaching system was designed to protect children, and unfortunately, by indoctrinating them against what Islam teaches, we are not helping them and protecting them, we are confusing them. And surely education as a primary tool in terms of primary requirement is not designed to confuse it should be designed to clarify and as such <clears throat> as such educationalists can't teach morality you can express the moralities that exist but you can't say this particular one is right and indeed there is another very pertinent uh, prophetic tradition of rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam where allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed to an angel to destroy a particular city with its people. Now you find this in all the scriptures, whereby if people disobey God, eventually a punishment comes in one form or another. It could be a disease, it could be a meteorological punishment, it could be earthquake, whatever, whatever. But there, are, there, was, there, there were these people and they refused to obey prophet after prophet, whatever. And they just carried on. They used their own desires as their guide. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, after warning them, He then said to the angel, it's time for them to be destroyed. And the angel said, Ya Allah, yes, but you know there is a person there. He completely obeys you. There's one person in, those, in that community. He completely obeys you. Even he wouldn't blink without your permission. That's how much he obeys you. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says he should be included in the punishment. Why? Because he doesn't object. He's quiet. He's accepting as to what's going on. And that's not part of being a God-fearing person. If you see an abuse, we have to say it. And we're not just talking about LGBT here. We're talking about other abuses. If you see human rights abuses, we have to say if we see uh, uh, people being uh, tortured in prisons, we have to say. If we see people being killed for no reason or held in, in concentration camps in China, we have to say. Even if the press isn't saying anything, even if the governments aren't saying anything, we have to say. Our duty is not just to preach what is right, but to object to something when it's wrong. Even if it's difficult to object, 
Otherwise, we become then guilty by association in this because we are quiet. And being quiet could mean we are being accepting. And that is a weakest of faith. So we, so we are not accepting. Alhamdulillah, we are able to put our case and we are able to convince schools as schools are, mashallah, now being convinced as sensible teachers and headmasters, alhamdulillah, are now being convinced. But they will need to be convinced. Uh, and to, to sh- uh, and they need to be shown the guidance notes from the Department of Education and from the United Nations, which require parental involvement, which require involvement of religious leaders, which, we, which do not require them to insist on a particular morality. That is, that is completely a misinterpreting, misunderstanding what the guidance notes and the, what the legislation says. So focusing now on the particular acts that we are talking about in terms of homosexuality and lesbianism and, and bisexual, uh, however, we turn to the Holy Quran, chapter 7, verses 80 onwards. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلُوتًا إِذْ قَالَ لِقَوْمِهِ Lut, alayhi salam, Prophet Lut or Prophet Lot, said to his people, أَتَأْتُونَ الْفَاحِشَةَ مَا سَبَقَكُمْ بِهَا مِنْ أَحَدٍ مِنَ الْعَالَمِينَ How do you commit such an indecency which no one in the world has done before you? إِنَّكُمْ لَتَأْتُونَ الرِّجَالِ شَهْوَةً مِنْ دُونِ النِّسَاءِ Where you approach men with desire instead of women. بَلْ أَنْتُمْ قَوْمُ مُسْرِفُونَ Indeed, you are transgressing. You are a sinful people. So Lut ﷺ, he advised them. He said, what you're doing is wrong. Now look at this discussion. Very mature. Very sensible, very calm. He actually met with them and said, what you're doing is wrong. And he advised them again and again and again. And this is a prophet of God, endowed with wisdom, endowed with huge, beautiful abilities, endowed with what is right and what is wrong. And beautifully explained, beautifully tried to guide. And practically none of them listened. In fact, what was their response? Well, Makana Jawab, their response was this, Qawmihi. Uh, the people didn't give an answer except this. Illa an qalu, except they said, Akhrijuhum min qariyatikum innahum unasui yatatahharum. Drive them out of your city. They try to, they kick them out of the city. They try to. Because they said, um, innahum unasui yatatahharum. They wish to be clean and pure, even with their own words. The transgressors, the sinners were saying that yes, what you're saying is, is correct. You want to be clean and pure. We don't want to be clean and pure. <clears throat> do, you see, do you see how they already know what's right and wrong, but they've chosen. They've chosen their lifestyle. They didn't say we were born this way. They didn't say we have to do this. No, it's a chosen lifestyle. We are following our desires as our God. This is how we want to behave. This is what we want to do. We, want to, we don't want to be people who are clean and pure. We don't want to be people who are following this religion. So drive these people out of the city. And Allah instructed Lut Islam after preaching for, after attempting many times, then Lut Islam left with his family and uh, maybe a, a few people who were guided by him. And then Allah destroyed the whole whole community. And we find this in, in all the scriptures. So it it, this follows, بَلْ أَنْتُمْ قَوْمٌ مُسْرِفُونَ And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, it follows. This is a qat'i principle, which means it is indisputable that it is haram. This practice is haram. Anybody who practices a committing is committing a sin. Anybody who says this is permissible, and that person calls themselves a Muslim, because it's not permissible, because it's haram, indisputably, undeniably, then this person leaves the fold of Islam. So making it permissible takes you out of Islam. So those people who say, I'm gay, I'm a Muslim, and it's allowed in Islam, I'm sorry, you're no longer a Muslim. You've left the folds of Islam. You're deceiving yourself, you're deceiving others, and you're deceiving the innocent children. These, Some of these people have gone to schools and said, I'm gay, I'm a Muslim, it's permissible. No. Don't give them the wrong information. That's not education. That's miseducation. That's misinformation. That's misguidance from all aspects. 
I'm saying to you now, if you promote his permissibility, then you're no longer a Muslim. And you can't be called a Muslim. And all ulama agreed. And anybody, any so-called alim who goes against this and says, no, no, it's fine. Shame on you. Shame on you for allowing this to happen when it's a qati principle. It is a clear principle. So you can't declare this as permissible when Allah has declared it as impermissible. Allah has declared it as, as haram. Bal antum qawmu musrifun. You are transgressors, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says. And the punishment, what's come, is absolutely clear. So it's an absolutely clear issue here. And the consequences of following such immorality, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has been clear about this. And you find this in Ibn Majah, where the Prophet has said, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that you will be tested with certain things. And he talked about immorality. Immorality never appears among a people to such an extent that they commit it openly. And let's face it, that's what's happening now. They commit it openly. It's completely in the open. It's everywhere, you'll find. I'm not just talking about lesbian and gay relationships here and bisexual relationships. I'm talking about heterosexual relationships as well where people, uh, they, they have relationships which are haram outside the, the husband-wife relationship. If this happens to such an extent, plagues and diseases that were never known amongst the predecessors will spread amongst them. Subhanallah. Can you, can you see this prediction 1400 years ago? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He knows what's good for us. He knows that if you follow this way, you live a, a structured, a, a peaceful, hopefully inshallah, a sensible and also a healthy and pure life. But if you go against his commandments, then you're going down a very dangerous, dangerous path. And to such an extent that if you practice this openly, diseases and plagues will come on, on, on the people. To such an extent you haven't even heard of them before. And... This is exactly what's happening. There are STDs now, which can't be cured. There are some strains of gonorrhea that can't be cured. It's, it's a very infectious disease. And now there are people in this world, and no doctor in the world is, is, is saying that they can cure them, because this, the strains that have been produced ha, ha, are now immune to all existing treatments. This is the stage we have reached. And I'm coming, I'm coming on to AIDS, inshallah, very shortly. But before I do, the Prophet also said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, this is Imam, this is Imam Malik's uh, Muatta, Rahmatullah, fornication does not spread in the people, but that there is much death amongst them. So death, disease, illness, this is a consequence. And let's look at AIDS. This so-called great sexual revolution that people are promoting and following their desires. And that's just not sexual revolution, a drug revolution. And I would also add an alcohol revolution. <clears throat> let's, let's put them all together because I want to talk about the consequences. Um, in terms of the sexual revolution, I've asked people a question about how many deaths have occurred of those people who have have had AIDS and AIDS, it it was just it, it was just found out in my lifetime. Those pe people of my age, you'll know. Suddenly, it appeared. Suddenly, doctors recognised there was an illness they couldn't treat. There was a virus, and they gave it the name AIDS, Advanced Immune Deficiency Syndrome, and they couldn't treat it. Even now, it can't be cured. With modern drugs, it can be controlled. And it can be minimized, but there's still no cure at the moment. Well, what's the result of this great sexual freedom and revolution? How many people have died of AIDS? And these are World Health Organization statistics. And you'd be surprised when I've asked people, including doctors, they've given me, given me figures. And to be honest, most have been way below the mark. 39 million people have died of AIDS worldwide. 39 million people, they've died of AIDS. I don't think that's a success. I think that's a complete failure. And we should ask ourselves, how have we allowed this to happen? And I've given you some guidance on this. 
and not just those who have died of, died of AIDS, how many people are waiting for death? 37 million people have AIDS, most of whom are waiting for death because most of them haven't got access to the expensive drugs and the, the cocktail of drugs that are being used to control this, this illness. 37 million people are waiting for death. This, this includes 1.8 million children. And these statistics, I'd say, are slightly underestimated. They're a little bit old now as well. I don't think that's a success. 35, uh, 37 million and 39 million. 76 million people. That's more than died in, in the Second World War. This is horrific. This is heartbreaking. And there's no search of anybody's conscience. There's no search of why this has happened. There's no questioning oneself. There's no morality to be learned from here. We have been warned by Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We have been warned by Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. It just needs a small change to follow the principle of marriage, which Islam promotes. Where, where a man marries uh, a woman and the sexual act is to have children and raise them as good, decent people, good, decent Muslims. That's what it's all about. That's a bottom line. That's a clinical assessment of what we're talking about here. But this so-called revolution where God's law is openly rejected and ridiculed Look at the results, and many Muslims have been affected, many, all countries have been affected, many lives have been affected, and are being affected. Truly horrific, tr a truly spectacular failure, one which we should be learning from. It's also useful to see what the Bible has to say on this, because as I said, this is not just a prohib prohibition in Islam. It's also in the scriptures of uh, Judaism and Christianity. And we find it in Leviticus. We're looking at uh, books 19 and 20. And by the way, these are understood by uh, academics of the Bible, <coughs> by researchers and philosophers of the Bible. Leviticus, in these particular books, these are considered to be revelation from God to Moses, to Musa alayhi salam. So these are not words of a human being in the scholarly assessment of a number of Christian and Jewish scholars. So we're looking at verse 22. This is book 19. Thou shalt not lie with mankind as with womankind. It is an abomination. So clearly it's rejected and considered to be haram, forbidden, in Christianity and in Judaism. And we find in uh, also book 20, verse 13, If a man also lies with mankind, as he lies with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. That's how serious it is in, in these old scriptures. The death penalty exists, and it still exists in a number of countries, by the way. I believe seven countries still have the death penalty. It's not being implemented, but it still exists. That's how morality changes. Now, we're not talking about penalties here. We're talking about promoting what Islam says in right and, and, uh, right and wrong. And I've uh, explained and shown what the Bible says as well, so this is throughout all major religions, therefore there's no right of schools to teach in this way that this is right, to promote LGBTQ like this and say this is right. No, it's right according to some people and it's wrong according to other people and that's how it should be taught and that, 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 that doesn't take too long, it doesn't take a whole term. It just takes a few minutes to explain. It doesn't take a whole series of books because then it's not teaching, it's indoctrination. It's saying this is right and then using Muslim names for gay people, as I've already explained. That can't, that's, not, that's not possible. You can't say it's permissible and be a Muslim and then use a Muslim name. I'm sorry, that should be explained to the children. So um, 
let's teach, let's construct the syllabus sensibly and maturely with parental consultation and consultation with religious leaders. And you will find then the teaching will become a blessing in the school. And everybody's happy and everybody's learning tolerance and everybody's learning how not to discriminate and everybody's learning that there are different belief systems in place and different practices in place and everybody's learning that there is disagreement on these issues and one can disagree without being discriminatory and without being violent surely that's the whole purpose of this exercise um, in conclusion I wish to mention why why this is happening. We've talked about following one's desires, but why is it becoming such an extreme issue and such a dangerous issue? Because there's a verse in the Holy Quran, Allah says, وَلَا تَقْرَبُوا الزِّنَا إِنَّهُ كَانَ فَاحِشَ وَسَاءَ سَبِيلًا It's 17 verse 32. Allah says, don't come near zina. Zina is adultery or fornication. Don't come near zina. إِنَّهُ كَانَ فَاحِشَ It is a very great evil thing. It's an abomination. وَسَاءَ سَبِيلًا and it's a road leading to evil. It's an evil road, meaning it's a road leading to other evils. And that's what's happening. We, 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 we say what we do in the privacy of our own home doesn't affect other people. Well, we've talked about these relationships and AIDS. What we do in the privacy of our own home has huge impact. As, as, as such, it's a very irresponsible statement to make because it's having an effect outside the home. Like, for example, uh, Islam and most of the world forbids, forbids most drugs, not all drugs, most drugs. Alcohol is also a drug, but uh, uh, most drugs are forbidden. Um, yet you take them in the privacy of your own home. But the, the murders in London that have taken place in the last couple of years, 700 murders of children, perpetrated by children, children killing children because of drugs. Most of these are drug related. So how can you say what I do in the privacy of my own home doesn't have an impact? These 700 children will disagree. The 700 murderers will disagree. It's an extremely irresponsible argument to make and an extremely wrong justification of committing what people are committing, especially looking at the consequences. So the solution is in our own hands. If we obey the commandments of God, and stop following our desires, then uh, we have a solution. So, wasa'a sabila, road leading to more evils. The perversion then of what is allowed becomes unlimited. And I don't want to discuss in detail, but I want to mention a few words. It's necrophilia. You look up the meaning. I don't want, even want to discuss it. And people have been convicted of this recently. There's paedophilia. Again, the same arguments people use, it's, I can't help it, it's the way I was born. No, it's your, it's your lifestyle, it's your choice. It's a confusion you have as to what's right and what is wrong. A bestiality. We're looking at, we're looking at uh, animal abuse here. We're looking at animal abuse parties. I don't even want to go into the detail. When Allah says, وَسَاءَ sabila, You're going to go down a road of evil and there's, no, there's going to be no limit. There's going to be people have died, people are in prison. There are the, the, the bestiality parties. I was reading an article recently. People who looked very pensioners, people who are professional, who are young, people who are uh, um, middle aged, they were at these parties and a number of have been jailed. As, as a result, we're talking about these parties being videoed and shared. Such is the confusion. Such is the abomination, such is the heinous nature now of, of actions of people. We have squashing. You may not have heard of this, I had to do this research. Squashing where you, you see a, a woman's uh, foot with a high heel squashing a kitten to death. Yes, yes, because this is someone's fantasy. And this is being shared on the internet. This is wasa'a sabila. You have people eating each other because that's their, that's their desire. That's their wish. The one to be eaten has said to the other one, 
I wish, I wish to be eaten. So he killed himself and the other person ate him. He cooked him and ate him. It's a completely true story in Europe. This is a confusion that exists. And we're talking about confusing our children more? No, shame on us. That's not education. That's not education. That is creating a schizophrenic and confused community. And we don't want that. We're not going to have that. So let's teach sensibly. Let's teach practically. Let's teach with consultation with parents and with religious leaders. And let's teach with the sensitivities of what, what religions are teaching and what religions are saying. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us and guide us. Ameen. May He allow us to live as good Muslims in this world, uh, enjoining what is right and forbidding what is wrong in a very beautiful and wise way. Ameen. وآخر الدعوانا أن الحمد لله رب العالمين